Welcome to the first of two screencasts on pediatric acute abdominal pain and surgical emergencies. In this first presentation, our objectives are to review how abdominal pain is localized and referred, set up an initial approach with an organized differential diagnosis for pediatric acute abdominal pain, and illustrate the typical clinical presentation and initial care for infectious gastroenteritis and constipation with or without fecal impaction. This first part about the localization and nature of abdominal pain should be a refresher. Recall that visceral pain arises from the stimulation of mechanical and chemoreceptors, primarily on visceral mucosa and smooth muscle. Because the afferent nerves in this pathway have fewer endings, are unmyelinated, and enter the spinal cord bilaterally at multiple levels, visceral pain is typically dull, poorly localized, and around the midline. Visceral pain from an affected area of the digestive tract can localize to one of three regions depending on its embryonic derivation. For instance, reflux esophagitis typically presents as epigastric pain in children because the esophagus is a foregut derivative. The foregut-derived portion of the GI tract extends from the pharynx to the second part of the duodenum, including the bud from which the liver and pancreas developed. The largest portion of the GI tract is midgut-derived and extends from the duodenum at the level of the papilla to the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. Injury to midgut structures gives rise to paraambulical pain. Last, inflammation of the hindgut-derived distal colon and rectum, as seen in ulcerative colitis on the left side, localizes to the suprapubic or hypogastric region. In contrast, somatic pain arises from receptors in the skin, skeletal muscle, and parietal peritoneum. It is carried by afferents that are numerous, myelinated, and transmit signals unilaterally to specific spinal levels, which are represented as dermatomes. It is thus localized, intense, and more likely to be increased with movement. Last, I wanted to touch upon the concept of referred pain, which is when pain is felt distal from its site of origin and results from the convergence of visceral and somatic pathways usually. This may be central or peripheral, such as the example when visceral disease extends to parietal structures or somatic nerves. As an example of the latter, 30-50% to 50 of us have a retrocecal appendix, which, if inflamed, can irritate the psoas muscle and lead to the classic sign of the same name. However, the genitofemoral nerve runs along the anterior surface of the psoas and can also be irritated, leading to referred pain along the genital branch to the scrotum and labia majora and along the femoral branch to the anterior thigh. Now I will briefly review the initial assessment and differential diagnosis of pediatric acute abdominal pain. I have adapted a pediatric algorithm from Australia developed as a clinical practice guideline for primary care providers to illustrate four points. One, there exists good evidence that adequate analgesia does not mask a diagnosis of a condition like acute appendicitis and thus should always be provided when needed. Two, in most causes of a surgical abdomen in pediatrics, a rectal exam does not add diagnostic value and may be distressing, thus it is not done routinely. However, number three is that perianal and inguinogenital inspection must still be done, particularly in pediatrics when the diagnosis is unclear. Number four, just as in adults, Red flags on history of physical suggestive of peritonitis warrant an immediate surgical consultation. However, the pediatric algorithm also emphasizes bilious emesis, inguinoscrotal pain or swelling, or palpable abdominal mass, associated with some causes of bowel obstruction that are far more common in pediatrics. Here we have organized the differential diagnosis for acute abdominal pain in pediatrics, with many similarities between adults and peds. However, for one, causes of GI obstruction are very different in pediatrics, and some gastrointestinal inflammatory conditions are more commonly seen in pediatrics. While extra-abdominal causes of abdominal pain can be seen at any age, in pediatrics they are more likely to represent the initial presentation of a chronic disease. Last, the ingestion of foreign bodies, toxins, and drugs are more likely to accidentally occur in infants and young children, or intentionally in the case of adolescents. Because the list is long, it is important to know about conditions that vary greatly in incidence with age. However, some important etiologies are common throughout pediatrics. Those related to the gastrointestinal tract include infectious gastroenteritis, functional constipation, appendicitis, and reflux esophagitis. I will now discuss the first two, focusing on clinically relevant information for acute care. Chronic constipation may lead to acute and debilitating abdominal pain, possibly with anorexia or vomiting, and this is especially true when fecal impaction develops. Because over 95% of pediatric constipation is functional, Understanding its pathophysiology is needed to manage acute pain and counsel patients and family to prevent recurrences. Children with functional constipation, by definition, have impaired elimination without an underlying pathology. However, there are often reasons why, mostly being related to situational withholding or unpleasant defecation associated with hard or dry stools. 
Common situations include toilet training, especially when it's coercive and the child isn't developmentally ready, and the start of school, especially when cleaner private toilets are lacking or toilet use is regulated or restricted. And stools are more likely to become dry and small after the introduction of solid food or infant formula, or in children with suboptimal fiber or fluid intake. Any organic cause of constipation can lead to withholding as well that can persist after you treat the organic cause because of the unpleasant defecation. Regardless of the reason, the end result of withholding is stool retention. Retained stools become harder as more water is reabsorbed, then accumulate as new stool arrives. Unfortunately, a mega rectum can form after constant and repetitive stretching, which now requires greater distension before an urge to defecate is generated, and so the retention of large caliber stools becomes beyond one's control. Their own three diagnostic criteria follow from this explanation. They include infrequent stools, hard or painful stools, fecal incontinence, excessive stool retention with associated behaviors and or postures, and finally, large caliber stools either evident on a digital rectal examination or by history. In terms of other investigations, while neither a DRE or abdominal x-ray are needed routinely, either can help diagnose fecal impaction in the rectum when it is suspected on history and the abdominal and or the rectal examination is unreliable or refused. Knowledge of whether or not there is fecal impaction does have some diagnostic relevance as you can see here as one of the criteria, but more importantly it can help guide management. As fecal impaction is one of the diagnostic criteria for functional constipation, it is clearly not a red flag for a possible underlying pathology. Functional constipation is not technically a diagnosis of exclusion because individualized testing for underlying pathology is only required if there are, are alarm features on history or physical or intractable constipation defined as continued constipation despite optimal management for more than three months. Irritable bowel syndrome has to be excluded as well. In the setting of fecal impaction, lower maintenance doses of PEG-3350 are often unsuccessful and can actually increase incontinence as more voluminous and watery stools bypass the impacted stool in the rectum. Fiber, a bulking agent, can worsen the problem if the impaction is not addressed. Thus, a full bowel cleanout is needed. For acute management, PEG-3350 is preferred because it is equally effective to enemas, but is better tolerated. High doses are required, with plenty of fluids for several days, and counseling thereafter is crucial to prevent recurrences, thus a maintenance therapy should also be prescribed. Infectious gastroenteritis is extremely common as well, and often benign. In pediatrics, however, acute gastroenteritis is the most common diagnosis made in cases of missed appendicitis and other surgical conditions. In the case of appendicitis, this is in part because young children are more likely to have diarrhea at presentation than at older ages. Features favoring gastroenteritis include recent infectious exposures, a temporal pattern with vomiting preceding abdominal pain and diarrhea, vague abdominal pain that waxes and wanes, and of course, if the child's exam is fairly normal aside from de dehydration. In contrast, appendicitis pain usually precedes the vomiting and is more likely constant, progressive, and or focal. Investigations in the setting of suspected gastroenteritis should be individualized but are usually not needed, as the vast majority is viral, confirming this is not necessary and will not affect care, unless the patient is being hospitalized and will be isolated or is immune compromised and this is included as part of a larger infectious workup. The likelihood of a non-viral etiology increases substantially if diarrhea is bloody or chronic, the patient is seriously unwell, or recent travel or exposures suggest this. So testing for bacteria and parasites would be important in these settings because antimicrobials may be recommended depending on what is isolated. Assessing electrolytes and renal function plus or minus glucose is warranted if the patient is severely dehydrated or has severe persistent diarrhea. Also consider excluding urinary tract infections, especially if the patient is a young female or if vomiting remains the predominant symptom. And as mentioned, depending on the age, consider a surgical consult or abdominal ultrasound when red flags exist. Acute care for all cases of infectious gastroenteritis is early rehydration with oral or enteral fluids preferred over parenteral access wherever possible. To conclude, the Australian guidelines have clearly also considered some of the extra abdominal etiologies, pediatric acute abdominal pain, building them into the latter part of this algorithm. In screencast 2, I will discuss some age-specific clinical conditions, including causes of surgical abdomen. Thanks for your time.